Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I have so much in bloom right now, especially this cute little cat layer right here. But today's video is going to be on the Phalaenopsis tetraspa species. So I've got three of them, including one that's in bloom right now. And I'm going to share how to care for this orchid and what I've learned along the way in growing this. So I have three of them, um, three different kinds of Phalaenopsis tetraspis. The C1, I have one that is C1 by Mr. Hui, and I have one called Phalaenopsis tetraspis imperatrix. So I'm going to share how these are generally cared for, um, what I've learned. They're a little bit more finicky than other Phalaenopsis type uh, species or gifts, but let's jump into its care, where it's from, and how to make them thrive. So this orchid is endemic to Southeast Asia, and um, it is it is a species. It's an epiphyte, Phalaenopsis, and they don't get too big. So I've noticed that they tend to have these leaves. They kind of hang over the pot, and even when they're mature, they don't get super massive, like say like a Phalaenopsis bellina. What's really cool about this orchid is that the blooms are not super uh, showy, they're not super big, but they tend to have different um, different blooms. They tend to all be unique, so every single flower in here looks a little bit different than the other. Now this one is the Mr. Huang, by C C1 by Mr. Huang, and then the C1, I don't have it in bloom right now, but this one has a bunch of cakeys coming in, so these are little babies that are going to come in, um, but when it does bloom, it's got red and white spots, so that's typical for a Phalaenopsis tetraspis. It tends to be a little bit more expensive, so when you get it, you want to make sure that you take good care of it so you don't lose it. My C1 cost $80, so that was pretty pricey in my opinion for a fowl, but it tends to be a really popular one. Um, now with the growth pattern, this is a sequential bloomer, so it pushes out multiple spikes and they tend to last for about a month, I'd say, and then they push out more blooms. They typically start blooming in the spring through the summer and it can go for about six months. So once they start blooming, you're going to get blooms for a while. Um, and this spike, it pushed out quite a lot of buds. It's taking a break for now. When this is done, it'll probably stop until the spring is coming. As I mentioned, the leaves tend to grow and they hang down. A mature plant can have seven, eight, nine leaves that are hanging down. Eventually the older leaves die off, but I find that this one doesn't get super, super big. Um, now it's a little bit different than other Phalaenopsis type orchids because this grows in a very hot environment. This is not a warm grower, this is a hot grower. So that's what makes it different from other Phalaenopsis orchids. You don't want the temperatures to get below 65 degrees on this. And during the day, it tends to thrive with temperatures between 85 and 90 degrees. So if you have a very cool apartment or home environment, or even if you grow it outdoors, you wanna be mindful of that because, because where it grows in the wild, it's constantly very hot. So that's why some folks could see this as a little bit finicky. I don't have that problem. Right now, my growth space is 80 degrees. 32% humidity, which is quite low, but this time of year, this, these temperatures are pretty typical for me. This 32% humidity right now, which is quite low. I need to turn on the humidifier and mist a little bit, um, but 66 degrees low and 80 degrees high for the day is pretty typical for me in the winter. These do get a day-night temperature differential in the wild, so whenever you're growing orchids in order to get them to bloom, that's pretty important. With grow lights, they tend to warm the area a little bit more, so that kind of helps give the day-night temperature differential, so that helps a lot. So if you're growing indoors, warmer lights kind of help in that way. Um, you obviously don't want something to get to over 100 degrees, now in the summer, the temperatures for me obviously get hotter. They can get up to 95 degrees. For this orchid, it's totally fine, but you never want the temperatures to go below 65 degrees. This is an epiphyte, so it typically grows on trees. So in the wild, it grows in a very, very humid environment. If you're growing this orchid indoors though, 
it's hard to maintain that humidity. So what I like to do personally is I grow all of my Tetraspis orchids and sphagnum moss, and that makes sure that it gets a lot of humidity around the roots. Um, typically, I wanna water it as it's approaching dryness. If you let it dry, that's fine, but you don't wanna let it dry for too long. This one is pretty dry right now, um, so I don't want it to get bone dry for more than say two days maximum. Generally it's fine, but I personally like to water as it's approaching dryness. So you water it, you make sure it, you make sure it drains through the pot so it's not soaking in there. Um, you don't want water to sit inside of the media. Let it drain, put it back in, in the little container that you have it in, the little uh, decorative pot that you have it in, and then generally it should be fine. And then you want to water it as it's approaching dryness. So as it's almost dry, maybe a little bit of moisture left, and these tend to do really well. That mimics the humidity that they have in the wild. These need at least 12 hours of uh, light in order to bloom. So I give all of my orchids at least 12 hours a day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then I increase that in the summer from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. I put everything on a timer, but but if you have one of these orchids and you don't have it blooming, it might be because it's not getting enough light. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, where this grows in the wild, it's very close to the equator. So whenever you're struggling with a species orchid, think of where it comes from in the wild. Look at what country it's from. Look at what the conditions are, what the sunlight is, that sort of thing, and that can sort of help. So with a lot of my species orchid, not this one in particular, but some of my species, they're only triggered by the difference in the time differential. So if you're struggling with a species, say you've had it for many years, one tip that I'd say is look to see where it's from, see where it grows and see what the environment is like, including the sunrise sunset situation. A lot of them near the equator, you don't get very much variation. So that's good to know, but some can be further up or down and you'll see some differences there. With this one, you need at least 12 hours of daylight. You may need to supplement in order to get it to bloom. The fragrance on this one is nice. It's light. I wouldn't say that it's a really strong fragrance. Again, it's not known for like, for having a very strong fragrance. It's known for having very unique flowers, um, but it has like a fruity kind of fragrance, which is quite nice. Um, and I wouldn't say that it fills the room up or anything. It's not like a Catlia, like that one right there that I'm obsessed with right now. It's not like that one. That one I walk into the room and it kind of fills the whole room up. And actually, when I walk into the apartment, I could smell it outside of the room, which is nice. This is not as strong as that, but when you put your nose to it, you could definitely smell like a fruity type of fragrance, which is really nice. In terms of fertilizer, I would just follow the instructions on your packet and that should be fine. I personally use MSU fertilizer. I feed in the growing season about 300 parts per million um, and that seems to work out pretty well for me and that's fine for this orchid. And then in the winter, when it's not growing as many leaves, um, I tend to give it 150 parts per million of fertilizer. Generally, you want to repot this orchid every year or two, depending on how it is in the pot. This one, I will probably keep it in here for another year. I repotted this in the spring, so this is fine. The roots are accommodated very well here. But if you're going to use sphagnum moss, um, that tends to break down pretty quickly, so you don't want it to go more than two years without repotting. Or else the media will get acidic and it's not great for the health of the plant. Um, so I recommend repotting at least every two years if you're um, going to use moss. Now if you live like in a very hot and humid environment, you might be able to get away with mounting it, especially if you have humidity of over 80%, but say you're in the United States, you grow indoors, you're going to have to use some sort of um, media, or if you're going to mount it, you have to water it daily. Um, and, and keep your humidity high with a humidifier sort of situation. 
but if you use bark, you wanna water it a little bit more. If you use moss, you wanna water it uh, a little bit less often, but generally you water as it approaches dryness and it should be fine. I'm glad that these are not that big, um, just because I have so many Phalaenopsis that have gotten so huge on me. So this is pretty nice. Like I said, they can be a little bit expensive. So if you find one, you wanna make sure you keep it alive, um, just given that the price of some of these. But they have a really nice variation on the flowers. Now there are Phalaenopsis speciosa as well. Those have now been classified under Phalaenopsis citraspis because it's now been known that these are very similar orchids. They may have the same sort of lineage um, from the same area, so now they are classified together. There's not a ton of hybrids of this one. The ones that I have are a little bit different, but in general, the biggest thing about them is that the flowers are all very unique, so you're not going to get the same flower. Many of them come out white with different red spots on them. Some of them come out red, but mostly you get white flowers with pink splotches on them, which are really, really cool. And like I said, they're not known for having these, these huge flowers. It's known for the uniqueness of each flower, which is pretty cool. Now, in terms of where I personally got these orchids, one of them is from Sophie's Orchids. I bought from my C1 from a friend. This is the one with all of the cakeys. Um, this one came from Sophie's Orchids. That was about $80. And then I got a couple. I got this one. This was gifted to me from my mom. This is the Phalaenopsis Tetraspis Imperatrix and the Phalaenopsis Tetraspis C1 by Mr. Wang. This came from Orchid Classics. So they have a set. Um, I'm not sure how much it was. Maybe it was three for 50, um, but they had, I'll put the information below, but they have a sale. They had a sale about a year ago of the Phalaenopsis to Traspis. So if you're looking for some, they have um, a variety of those orchids as well. In short, this orchid is, I don't find it very hard, but some people say it's a little bit finicky and I'd say it's because it's a hot grower, not a warm grower, so it needs very hot conditions. You never want the temperatures to get below 65 degrees and the humidity in the wild tends to be pretty high. So if you have a tetraspis that's declining, I recommend if you're an indoor grower to get a heat mat, you could put it under. Get the heat mat, just turn it on during the day, turn it off at night unless your temperatures are too cold at night then i would turn it on at night but you never want the temperatures to get below uh, 65 degrees and then that should take care of the requirements for that orchid you want to make sure they get 12 hours of light at least every day you can do that with artificial lights if you're growing on windowsills you're going to have very slowed growth in the winter especially in the northeast if you're just growing say like on an east facing window or something like that so you may need to supplement with natural light with you may need to supplement with artificial light like i do i grow 90 percent of my collection under lights water it as it's approaching dryness if it dries out a day or two that's totally fine you can water it abundantly again and it should be good but in all i personally don't find it too hard just watch the temperatures don't let it get above 95 degrees don't let it get below 65 degrees and you should be golden anyway guys i hope this video was helpful let me know down below if you have any questions and i will see you in the next video bye everyone